I know you guys are waiting for the kill switch story. So here it is, plus a lot more in this video. When I saw the girl, I had my spotty sense kind of went off that she was going to be trouble. And surely enough, she was. She rented the car for two days and she asked me some questions. And this is something that I consistently hear. Can you bring the car to me? And she said, is there a way for you to pick up the car? With no mention of paying me for picking up the car. Because here's the thing. If I were to drop off the car, I would have to take an Uber back and that's gonna cost me wherever they are, 15, 20, 30, $40, depending on where they are, right? So that right there was a big alert because Anyone that's going to ask you if you will drop off the car for free has no consideration for your time or your business. So that was red flag number one. Red flag number two, the dude that brought her, his car was in the parking lot. Um, for some reason, he just got stuck there. Um, he was out in the parking lot for two hours after she left. And reason three, since she took a car that had the GPS kill switch on it, I knew exactly where she lived because this is one of the interesting features about the GPS kill switch. It has a feature that will track where the car spends the majority of its time to let you know where they live. And she lives in a hotel. The Super 8 on Old Nat, Old Nat as they used to call it, Old National. So she rented the car for two days, right? And instantly became late. And I waited and I waited. And at the 24 hour mark, I cut the car off, but she still had the car running. The GPS kill switches, which is I think a very good design because like someone could be on the highway and you turn off the car and the car goes off, that could lead to an accident. That could lead to a fatality. So I get it. So apparently she still had the car off when I turned on the GPS kill switch. And guess where she was going? to the gas station. Some more things to figure about because essentially I have a procedure that when someone's late, I start messaging them because one of the things I've learned is I need to message these people early. Like literally people, if they're two or three hours late, they're getting a message from me. Are you bringing back the car? Or are you going to extend instantly? And this has cut out a lot of foolishness because it's like, oh, I got to pay this guy or he's going to keep bugging me. So I started that and she said, oh, I'm going to extend Then She said I was going to bring it back. Two hours went by, five hours went by, 10 hours went by and I was tracking where she was. She was actually working. She was she was doing Uber Eats and she was actually going to restaurants, delivering food and she goes back to the hotel. And at this point, I'm like, OK, it's 24 hours. Cut off the car. So I cut the car off and I find out that the car moved. <laughs> it moved to a gas station and at the gas station, she turned the car off and she put guess how much gas in here. Just take a wild guess because essentially I'm beginning to understand these people. I'm beginning to understand that essentially they will tell me anything to get me off of them to make me go away. So if you put in your guess for the comments, I will talk about, I will tell you how much gas she got. Now, when I first met her, she was white girl skinny. She's a really little woman, about five foot nothing, maybe 95 pounds. I mean, she's that skinny, very small, small feet, small everything, just really, really little with a bunch of hair. Like, I mean, look like one of those troll dolls, right? Or brat dolls. And I've learned that my spotty sense is really good at picking up people. And essentially, this is the funny thing. She did not tell me the car would not start. She just like, cause I asked her, cause once again, my whole, I didn't even get to go into my little speech. Oh my goodness, the car ain't working. Leave the keys in it and tell me where it is. I didn't even get to go into that. Uh, she was just like, she sent me a message. It's at 
the Chevron station. And it wasn't at the Chevron station. It was at the gas station next door. Because, uh, I, you know, the GPS location, it took me to the area. Because the GPS location isn't 100% spot on. Uh, it'll probably get you within 50 feet of the car. So we go to this one station. There's no car. Then there's another station next door. We go there. And the car is at the gas pump. And the keys are in there. And here's something else. She only had the car three days. It was dirty. It wasn't trashed because I didn't even have to wash it, but it was dirty. There was uh, some deodorant. There was uh, cookies. And she also had the auxiliary cable where you could plug it in so you could play your whatever on your phone through the car radio. And then she had a charger and some other stuff and there was a bottle of water and there was other stuff in the back that I, I, I quite don't remember and essentially this is telling me because if I didn't have that GPS kill switch this is what would have happened she would have had that car for a week or two all right for those of you who guessed she had put in a third of a tank this is the only reason I had gas in it and she put in a third of a tank because that's where her money was and she was going to continue to use the car, even though she was supposed to be bringing it back. So lessons learned from the GPS kill switches. I bought two more cars this week and they're over there getting GPS kill switches in tomorrow. I am not renting, I bought a BMW, I bought a Porsche, I'll talk about that in a whole separate video. Um, I have learned my lesson. I have learned my lesson. Also, I had a Toro rental today, and this guy's gonna be a problem. And I'm gonna tell you why it's gonna be a problem. He was, he said, I'll be there at 10, and he said he was going to get an Uber, right? He shows up at 1040. I'm pissed, because I got a lot of stuff to do today. And I'm like, okay, he's one of them. And then, it's not an Uber, it says homeboy. Why are you gonna tell me you're in the Uber when your homeboy brings you? See, this is the stuff, and also he's supposed to bring the car back Sunday, and now he's talking about bringing it back Saturday night. I don't know what's gonna happen. I, I've been too busy to even track his whereabouts, but uh, essentially this is someone that could become a problem in the future because He's late, he wants to turn the car in early, he's making all these requests. He sent me a message, does the Bluetooth work? I'm trying to pair my phone, and I sent him a message. It works just fine with my phone, I have an iPhone 12. So, uh, one of the things that happened this week, and like the GPS kill story ain't really that climatic because essentially I could sop someone from keeping my car for a week or two which is very important because i got my car back after 24 hours the next day it rented out then that guy brought it back and it's it's rented out again so instead of losing two weeks of rental income the gps kill switch enabled me to recover my property and put it back in the system and just keep on trucking so i am a loyal student a loyal convert of the GPS kill switch. So the story ain't really that exciting because you know she didn't trash the car, she didn't do anything crazy. And part of that is because she didn't have the car long enough. One of the things I have discovered with these people is I gotta get my car back as soon as possible. Anytime someone keeps a car for weeks and weeks and weeks and they stop paying, it's gonna come back trashed. So I'm really grateful for the GPS kill switch. All righty, let's get into the day is Thursday and I've taken, I've lost two cars this week. As you know, the Camry, which was wrecked, which is going to have a happy ending because I'm going to make some money on that. Here's the other loss. Remember the Acura? Now that I get the rest of the story, because the story that I got was that the sea ball joint broke. I did not get the story that I hit something. They showed me the tire. They showed me. And 
as you can see in the clip, this car is, uh, is from up top. It's a Northern car. There's a ton of rust on the underside of it. And the, when I was talking to one of my other mechanics, they was telling me that rust, more than likely, if the car came from north and had a lot of rust, that can weaken the joint. And that's pretty much what happened because uh, the other joint, the guy pulled on it, was pretty stable. But this one was trashed. And he hit something because the tire has a gash in it and hit something hard and that broke the CV, C ball, the CV, the C ball, the ball bearing joint, whatever it's called. And um, he hit something so hard that it jammed the axle into the engine and they can't get it out. And the repair shop, um, they're treating me right. The guy called me up and said, I want you to come look at it. I need to tell you some stuff. He said, this could get very pricey very quickly because our only option to get that CV joint out is to take the suspension, not the suspension, but the exhaust off the catalytic converter and go for, and approach it from that end. And they were just showing me that all these screws were rusted. And he's like, man, I put a wrench on that. He said, it's either going to shear off or it's going to round the screw because there's not enough metal in that. They walked me through it and they spent like 15 minutes explaining to me. Shoot itself off. That's what's like just pushing the ball. Yeah, this right here is really connected at all. I'm right up out of here. It's all it's holding it together. Man. The impact on the tire, I mean, you can see that right there. I mean, it goes down pretty far. So something was impacted pretty decent at that point. I see. And you get up into here. That's all axle grease and everything else, but that is basically the other end of that guy. And it just wobbles in place. It goes into the intermediate shaft on the other side but it does not, it does not want to come out at all. There's a cert clip on the other side of this axle where it basically goes in and kind of locks itself in place and prevents it from backing out. If that got twisted in the impact or anything else, that could be holding it in there, but you could beat on it for days and it probably not come out. It could also actually just be rust. Yeah. yeah. You know, weather got in there and it's just rust around the clip and it doesn't have enough room to squeeze in and be pulled out. Because when you put the axle in, the clip is supposed to be compressed and then it snaps in the place. Alright. But not your ears what we're talking about. As far as the because that's on axle grease. You can see how some of the exhaust hangers and these right here, you would have to take these off. These three to get them off. And all of that would probably just come off in your hand. You could probably hit this exhaust enough hard enough with a hammer and it'll fall out. But anyway, all these mounting points, they don't have to come off to get the, makes the exhaust to drop down so we can see where the intermediate shaft goes in at. And it's, you know, it's more, more rust up in here and everything else. And this is the cat right here. So all of this is caked in rust and the, the chances of all that, any of that coming off, it's extremely slim. All righty. But you can see it's got, you know, it's, the rust itself basically it'll eat these components first and just the metal's not treated it's just stamp steel is all it is uh -huh. there's no kind of rust prevention or anything in any of it but it will eventually heat all of it at one time so you got to do exploratory exploratory surgery yeah just to even see if it's see even if it's viable is to basically install the new arm and ball joint. What my options was, and the guy who manages the place was like, honestly, uh, based on what we're seeing on this car, this car is gonna be a problem going forward, even if we fix it. I suggest you just take the, take the loss and let it go. And that's more than likely what I'm gonna do because I called up a Savage Art. They're willing to give me 450 for it. <laughs> so, uh, I don't I can't leave it there forever so I got a little time and they're gonna work up some other numbers but this car is haunted 
This car has been towed not once, not two times, but three times. And one of the things that when you're buying cars, you should be very aware of if they have the two original keys. This car doesn't even have one original key. It has a clone key that doesn't open up the door, which necessitated me calling a locksmith to get into the car when the battery died because the key wouldn't open up the door. Lesson learned. I'm just going to take the L and this is going to be about a $5,000 L because the Camry is going to offset some of that because I paid like 6,800 for it. So I'm just going to take the L and keep it moving because one of the things I've learned and you know, there are many people in the comments who are talking about $4,000 for a car. Let me tell you what you're going to get with a cheap car. If you hunt long and hard and spend weeks, you could probably find a car for $4,000 that isn't trashed, that isn't uh, wrecked, and you can put on the platform and make some money. I don't have that kind of time. Essentially, um, I'm just going to spend the money because, you know, someone made a comment. There's another GPS service. And essentially, I dropped my two cars off there. Tomorrow, I will have GPS kill switches. And Saturday, those cars will be rented out. So speed, I will pay for speed and being able to drop it off and know the next day that I will have my GPS kill switches. So one of the things that I want to talk about, because a, a lot of you guys have pushed back on me, because when I was running around today, I had to take two Ubers. And the second Uber, this is really interesting. The second Uber was driving a Mercedes M wagon. And this girl, she's an older lady, older people are not afraid of work. This girl says she's gonna do six figures from Uber this year. She said last Saturday she made 700 bucks. So y'all can go ahead and put in the comments that Uber doesn't pay. Here's the thing, and I'm, I may hurt some of your feelings. Y'all don't wanna work because the, she told me her schedule. She says Monday is kind of a slow day, Tuesday, but Friday, Saturday, Thurs, Thursday she takes it easy, but Friday and Saturday, she said between Friday and Saturday, she can make 1,000, 1,400 bucks, those two days. And those are her power days. And she's got a strategy in the schedule. And she started doing Uber in a BMW. And then she upgraded to a Mercedes ML wagon. You see where I'm going with this. Uber drivers, and I, I had an Uber driver the other day who told me that he didn't like Camrys, he thought they were trash. What is happening is, if you're in an Uber, that's your office. And a lot of people are spending the money to get nicer vehicles, to get nicer equipment, because if you're gonna work 12 hours, you wanna be comfortable and you wanna be driving something you wanna drive. And she drove a Mercedes, because at first when I saw it, I was like, she's coming in with a Mercedes. I, I thought I had chose the wrong thing. And she came in with a Mercedes, very nice lady. Uh, she provides snacks. She's a mom, she provides snacks. She has little snacks, little water bottles, little chips and stuff and everything. And what she's doing, and I, I gave her a nice little tip, what she's doing is providing higher level of service. And where am I going with this? Many of you have been telling me to buy, Acura, to buy Hondas and Camrys and stuff. And I've only been doing this 11 weeks and I'm not set up because essentially I will agree that if I had my own commercial insurance and I put an ad on Craigslist saying, hey, you can rent this car for 2,500 bucks a month, regardless of what I have, insurance included, they would roll out, they would roll out. But I'm not, I don't have my own commercial insurance yet. And also, interesting thing with that, Geico called me. Geico said they're not going to renew one of my policies. I have three policies. Because you can only have nine cars per policy, right? So I've maxed out two, and I am two cars away from maxing out the third policy. So they said that they're not going to renew my policy expiring in October because they want me to verify that I am not running a business. And this is what's funny. Geico has never have to worry about me filing the claim unless I am actually 
I actually can't file a claim because I only bought liability. I cannot file a claim. So I don't know why they tripping, but once again, if you have a fleet of cars and you're using Geico, they may trip a little bit. They may trip a little bit because I was like, huh, so I have until October. So I have August and September and I got to October 21st to get my commercial policy. So I'm gonna do that because essentially uh, by October, I should have 30, 30 cars, 30 some cars. So I'm gonna get my commercial policy because one of the reasons I wanna hit 30 and this is why this week is so dramatic. I lost two vehicles this week, two vehicles. And I've only been doing this three months and the Camry's gone, the Acura's gone. And essentially let's look at what's gone. The cheap cars, the cheap cars, the cars that everyone's like, Hey, get these cheap cars. The cheapest cars, well, the, the, the Camry was like 8,000, but the Camry has made like $2,000. And you make that, subtract that 2,000 from the eight, that brings me down to six. Then I get a check for 3,000 in three to four weeks. Then that brings me up to five. Then I sell the Camry for 5,000 as is. Uh, I feel that I can sell that Camry for four or 5,000. And I actually, like two, three, five, 10. So that's like a $2,000 profit, which will offset the L that I'm going to take with the Acura because I'm starting to listen to my little inner voice on certain things. Like uh, I looked at some cars this week and I passed on them because my spotty sense says, don't buy this car. I really, really wanted to buy this car, but my spotty sense said, don't do it. And my spotty sense also said, I should buy the cars that I bought and I will do a separate video about that because I'm learning to listen to that little voice because that little voice told me the chick living in the hotel was going to be problems. It told me that. And one of the things, and let's get back to Uber right now, you can make a gang of money on Uber. I don't care where you are in the country. If you're willing to work and let's define work. Uh, a lot of these DoorDash and Uber Eat videos, they're like, I work a three hour shift, four hour shift. This woman, she works 12 hour shifts, Friday, Saturday. She works 12 hour shifts and a seven hour shift on Sunday and a 10 hour shift on Friday. That's how you make the money. You don't make the money like trying to cherry pick, trying to drive when you want to drive. And once again, all now I have like two Uber drivers renting my cars and they both do 12 hour shifts. They go hard. And incidentally, they're never late. I wonder why, because they're making money. And this woman told me, she says she calculated it. She will do six figures from Uber this year. Because she takes advantage of all the specials. She drives, she works about her mileage. She's got a nice little strategy. Since I drove for Uber, I know her strategy works because it's very similar to the strategy that I developed in 2014. It is 2021 and it still works. It still works. And a lot of you guys are like Uber, Lyft, they changed the price. Y'all don't want to work. Look, I I'm going to say this with the most affection that I can muster. Stop being so lazy. And y'all, a lot, a lot of y'all hate that when I say it, these folks ain't lazy. They figured, no, they lazy. They're lazy. And if you're going to be lazy, during this global reset that is happening right before our eyes, it is going to catch up with you. In a pandemic, I am making money. And also, I did some calculations today. And essentially, I'm gonna explain why I'm buying more cars. I'm probably at $850, $900 a day rental income, right? And one of the things that is happening is a lot of these cars that I bought were neglected so the services and the repairs have to be happening. And I just grip my teeth and just go ahead and get it done because next month I won't have to do that service or that repair on that car. And one of the things that I'm, re I'm realizing is if I get to $1,500 a day, which is gonna take a few more cars, because essentially I did the calculations last night. 
If I rent out everything I have currently, not including the two cars that are gone, not including, actually including the two cars, I got some cars in the shop, including those cars, I would make $1,111.15 a day if everything's rented out. So I've added two more cars. I think I didn't put the one in the day. And essentially, I may get another car this month and that should get me my 12 to 1500 per day. Now, why is that important? If I'm making 1200 to 1500 dollars a day and I have a two thousand dollar repair that is covered in two days, I have made thirty thousand dollars and I have thirty five thousand dollars in repairs. So I'm closing that gap because once again, I'm buying used cars. This is going to be part of my life. I'm developing relationships with my mechanics. They're throwing in freebies. They're doing stuff because I'm doing so much business. And um, I feel that next month is going to be way better in terms of repairs and stuff than this month because I just got these cars and I'm fixing all this stuff. I mean, I, I, the X5, it needs a new headlight because I was thinking that I just needed bubs. But whoever had this car, they tricked it out. They lowered it. They put an exhaust on it and they tuned it and they did some other tinkering. So the headlight unit was burnt out. So now I got to buy a new headlight unit. I just grit my teeth and I'm going to do it because I feel that vehicle is going to make me a lot of money and I'm going to take care of it. So this month I will probably do another eight. I'm thinking because we have nine more days. So I may do another 8,000, which will put me at 18,000 for the month, which will put me at 38,000 for three months. And then next month, since I got two new vehicles and a new pricing strategy that's about to go into effect, I should clear 25, if not 30 next month. And essentially what's gonna happen is, right now I'm taking L's because essentially it's, it's kind of funny. Back in the day when people would open up stores, they would have so much store space or floor space because they needed floor space to make X amount of dollars. I need more cars to get ahead of the repair curve. And once I'm ahead, then it's going to be cake because essentially um, I fixed a lot of stuff. And essentially I got to sit on the Camry until I get my check and then I'm going to sell it. I'm not going to sell it because they're going to want to look at it. And then the Acura, I'm probably just gonna, you know, uh, I may put it on Craigslist for a thousand bucks because essentially it cannot stay in that shop forever because it's on the lift. And um, I gotta call them tomorrow and talk about that because um, you can't move the car without a tow truck. So that that's one of the issues because we could put a tire and stuff on it and we can roll the car around, but you know, I'm just spending money after bad money. So yeah, that's my plan because essentially I have learned a lot in these three short months and essentially I'm getting ready to adjust all my pricing. I have my Acura's too cheap. And this is why whoever has them, they have them because they can't find this kind of car of this kind of quality for that price. They can't. And essentially once they, cause essentially what I'm seeing is they keep the car for six weeks to eight weeks and they turn it in for some reason. So when the Acras come back and I have two Acras, yeah, two Acras that are on long-term rental, when they come back, I'm gonna adjust the pricing and I'm gonna change the payment protection. And essentially the new vehicles, I've adjusted the pricing because like the guy who called me today, this was really interesting. He was like, um, I need a tire. There's a scash in the tire. And I was like, when you left, that tire was fine. And one of the things I'm starting to do is I convinced him to fix the tire because I'm like, look, that car was fine when you drove out in it. That tire was fine. There was no gash in it. There was nothing. You hit some. And essentially I'm pushing back responsibility because that girl who uh, flattened two tires because she went over a pothole and ran away. I'm like, and I'm going to start like, look, if the car has a flat tire, that means you ran over some and you gotta fix that. I'm just letting you know. Don't be calling me in the middle of the night saying, hey, I need a tire. 
Because this is the thing. I had someone who wasn't paying me who like the car needs a tune up and needs two tires and needs this. And I'm like, dude, you ain't even paying me. Come on, you want me to take care of this vehicle so you can use it and you ain't paying me? And he brought the vehicle back. He said, you got a good point. You got a good point. So I got all that stuff done. And I'm gonna to continue to get this stuff fixed because um, very interesting. This car that he brought back that needed the stuff, I got everything done. It cost me $2,000 and it went into the hands of a week long renter. And what I'm seeing time and time again, people who rent for three days, who rent for a week, they're typically not a problem. And she's got a good car that's gonna get her what she needs to do so she can make some money. So uh, she also said that she planned on renting it for a while, so we will see. But that's what's going on, man. That's what's going on. I know the GPS kill switch story wasn't that exciting and I feel that because now I have the ability because like I said I got two new cars they both gonna have GPS kill switches in them tomorrow and one of them will be going on Toro um, I feel that the stories are gonna be interesting because like I said that week that I got angry and I kind of turned the corner and I'm, I'm starting to manage this better and I see next month because let's see um, I got one credit card paid off because I was doing all kinds of stuff on that credit card. So actually, funny thing is, I called them up and I told them that I lost a card because I had some automatic debits and stuff coming out. And I was like, you know what, I'm gonna stop this. That card will be paid off tomorrow and I owe 12,000 on this other card and I'm probably going to pay eight and I'm probably going to spend four. So that will put that car at like 15, 16,000 at the end of the month, depending on upcoming spend and stuff. So I will be able to pay it off because like I said, uh, going into August, I should be at a thousand or more per day. And each day I just pay on that credit card. So first 12 days, get that card paid off and then start stacking money to buy cars in August. And essentially I may just go ahead and once I get enough money, I may just pull the trigger and buy a car, you know, cause one of the things is once again, the goal is to get ahead of the repair curve. And also I am buying better cars. The two cars I bought today were super clean, no issues. Uh, one was very expensive. It was 25,000 and I'm just going to get away from the cheap cars because I have some cars that are kind of rough. And when I get them back, I'm just going to trade out of them and get something a little better because essentially I want to build a reputation of having good quality cars. And I already have people stalking me because I'm the only one with that many BMWs on the whole platform. I think at the moment I have the gold, the gray, the silver, the black, the gold, the black, the white, the X5, the X5. I have nine BMWs and essentially I've rented every last one of them. And I'm probably gonna buy some more because essentially I'm gonna move to like 2010, 2011. And then that's gonna be the litmus test because essentially, even though I'm having repairs with the BMWs, I am not having the issues with the BMWs that I'm having with the Camrys and the Acras. Uh, that bumper, someone left a comment, and then you know, but the same thing happened with the bumper. And I, I, I started noticing, I see a lot of Camrys with the bumpers just kind of hanging on. So I think that's a design flaw. But that's all I got for you guys. And once again, with the corporate papers, what I'm offering right now is a pre-sale because essentially every morning I gotta get up and do something. So I will be able to create the training this weekend uh, Saturday and Sunday, and then you will get some training. And also, something else I'm getting ready to do. I'm gonna create a separate consulting portal for students only. If you're a student, instead of paying, you know, the consults going to 2,500, um, end of um, August, 1st of August, and then I'm gonna offer $500 consults for students. So you're gonna be saving like 
$2,000 off consults and you can speak to me more frequently. And then that's something that I decide to do. And you will have to pay in full to get immediate access or you will have to wait until your payment plan is up to have access because I'm gonna send it to everybody, but if I check out and see you on the payment plan, I'm just gonna cancel your, your, your consult and refund your money. Because essentially, I've learned a lesson, because essentially if I cut out that I'm doing consults for $500 for all students, someone would sign up for 200 bucks, get a few consults and then dip. I already know how that goes, so that ain't happening. So just letting you know, if you pay in full, you will have access to the $500 consults. And I think a lot of people are gonna take advantage of that. Link is below and the price, I'm gonna move the price from 2,500 probably up to 3,000 the 1st of August because at the 1st of August, there's gonna be a lot of content there. There's gonna be a lot of training there. So that's all I got for you guys. I will see you in the next one.